Welcome to an introduction to the world of A.E. Cairns. A.E. Cairns, or Alexander Cairns, is a very special person. Not only is he an artist, here's one example of his work, he repairs and rebuilds steam engines like I do, but on a much larger scale, look at the size of this thing. It's a Holly Gaskill engine, and it's one of five sisters that live in Buffalo, New York, on the shore of Lake Erie, and their purpose is to pump fresh water. And each of these engines pumps 30 million gallons of fresh water every day. And as I've just said, there are five of them, so that's quite a lot of water. And if you're feeling the need to go to the toilet, I think now's the time. This next engine is much smaller in comparison to the previous one, and this is in Woburn, Massachusetts. And the last time this engine run was in 1933, and this is actual live footage at the time of the first run after it was put back together by Alexander Carnes and his friend Phil Christopher. I first met Phil Christopher when he was working at the steam workshop here in England. I love the architecture and design of these engines, even the handrails are works of art. Here's a view from above with the engine running at a good speed really. The engine's running at 45 RPM and at this modest speed, believe it or not, this engine is capable of pumping 5 million gallons of water each and every day. Alexander Carnes is also an artist and it shows in some of his camera work, I love this shot. And I also love Alexander's artwork, this is something that he drew when he was actually rebuilding the engine. This is hand drawn, not computer generated. I've watermarked it because he does sell prints of this. This is a highly speeded up time lapse of Alex and a man called Philip Beard working on another engine. And this one is the Philipsburg engine in New Jersey. And once again, just two people restored this engine to working order. Alex is fully self taught just like me, and here is using oxyacetylene to free up some stuck parts. And from the sublime to the ridiculous, this is a propane torch, and just look at the size of this. Alex calls it a Saturn V rocket on a stick. Here's an example of computer-generated art by Mr. A. E. Carnes. The design incorporates some letters into the base of the engine. Here's another one of his creations. Here's an image of a synchroscope created using flash. This is a specially made new part for the Philipsburg engine after it had been machined and fitted. This is a great gadget. Originally built in the 1900s, it's Tate's Patent Automatic Steam Shutoff. Moving across the Atlantic, now here we see a shot of Alexander at a place called Grains Mill in Lancashire in the United Kingdom. As usual, with his hands on the job. And now for something completely different, look at the size of this thing, it's just ridiculous. This is Ellen Road Mill in Lancashire, and Alexander's pointing out that there is some side float on the main crankshaft. Any viewers who suffer from claustrophobia should really turn off now. This is Alex underneath the engine, whilst it's running. Look at this. Well, that's not too bad, but then this is under the flywheel, weighing 90 tonnes and spinning at 70 revs per minute. And as you've just heard, the flywheel, apart from weighing 90 tonnes and spinning at 70 RPM, is 28 feet in diameter. Back over to the USA now, and this is Alexander doing an impression of Fred Dibner. And here he is, happily driving a 10-ton Buffalo Springfield roller. And back in the UK, here he is again riding on the top of a Sentinel steam lorry. This is not a scene from the Shawshank Redemption. Alex is cleaning out a very rusty steam pipe, so I thought it would be a good idea if I gave him the opportunity to clean one of my engines. I'll hand you over to Alex directly. I'm in the infamous Keith Appleton's workshop and I have been conscripted into cleaning his locomotive. Mind you, it does need a cleaning. An English engine can't be like an American engine. It can't have specks of dirt or shoddily applied paint or rust all over it. We, we sort of have that as a trademark. We need to have clean engines here. And uh, I guess you could say I'm getting the Swindon Fitters Boy treatment, being uh, sort of put down to clean an engine but that's that's most of my life is cleaning engines so I'm sort of used to it it's a very nicely made one this is a titch but sort of blown up I think um, over double size I believe no it, it is about double size designed by LBSC that Curly Curly is a very prolific model engineer he was pr probably the the father of live steam 
really, if you think about it, as we know it anyway. And uh, he was also uh, supposedly a cross-dresser and quite a character. I have a few of his books. Anyone out there with a Maisie or a Titch or a Juliet or uh, a William will know exactly who he is. And uh, he, he sort of, he was one of the people, one of the heavy hitters that started all this. And he built, I really can't tell you how many locomotives, must have built nearly a hundred of them or more. LBSC was interesting because he was the first one that sort of made it possible and palatable for the common man and hobbyist to build a working, robust, and strong model steam locomotive. Before that, it was these, uh, first of all, it was very specialized, and second of all, they were more toys than working models. These things are these very low-pressure water tube boilers. You couldn't really ride behind the thing, and they were all very fussy. The chassis was underbuilt, that kind of thing. And um, when LBSC got in, he, he, uh, he proved that the scale fire tube boiler was, was uh, mechanically feasible even at small sizes. He, and he made engines that were built really to run. The pieces were oversized. They weren't scale, but you could build an engine half the size of this and put you and three of your mates on the flat car behind it and go tearing down the track with it. A rare shot of me on camera just to frighten the children. I'd just like to say that this is a very experimental engine. I messed about with the design. I took the basic dimensions from LBSC's design, which I think was re-released by Kenyon Brothers, if I remember rightly. On this locomotive, you have what's called a Walshart's valve gear. It's one of the more common types of valve gear on a steam locomotive. And it has two distinct features. The first one is similar to a Hackworth or a Wolf gear wear. The reverse is accomplished by changing the phase 180 degrees. Forward gear goes right from the return crank pin through the, through the link, right up the rod, so that when this rod moves in one direction, so does this. And this carries the motion to the valve. When, however, you put this on the other end of the link, the motion is reversed. When this goes forward, the other one goes backwards. So a 180 degree phase flip is how you reverse the engine timing. This feature on the end the pendulum lever, which connects to the crosshead, adds a different phase to that motion. If this here is 90 degrees out of phase with the crank pin, this is taking it zero degrees phase relation to the crank pin. And you can get a different type of motion other than a sine wave out of this valve gear, which can be adjusted to give a more ideal valve event for something like a locomotive. The lead on this valve gear is fixed. It is not variable the way it is on a Stevenson's. You have to change the dimensions of the valve gear to change the lead. Mr. Appleton has actually made a superior type of expansion link in this valve gear. Normally you'd see the slot and the die block from the side and the rod, radius rod, would have a split in it. This one is a marine style expansion link which is a stronger type and it's less prone to wearing out prematurely. So I like what he's done here. I'm very happy to clean it inside and out. I'm used to that kind of thing as I said before. But uh, I, love, I love the track around this house. It's like a sort of like a childhood fantasy, all this street running track laid inconspicuously in concrete. And besides, getting it running again, I think, would make some very good footage for some stuff, especially because this engine may or may not be sold in the future. And of course, with Keith moving house, I'll never get another chance to run on this wonderful railway again. So I'm quite displeased with him. <laughs> I'm not sorry. When Keith built it, he did make one mistake. This is forward gear. With a Walshart's valve gear, the thinking is, and with a Stevenson's in fact, that down is forward. And the reason for this is, unless you're talking about a contractor's or a mining locomotive which spends just as much time in its life going backwards as forwards, the majority of the time in a locomotive's life is spent running forwards, especially in the case of a big, fast, mainline engine. This hanger was always a point of concern, because if this is in forward gear, and this hanger were to break or fail, or the bolt going through it were to break or fracture. This being forward gear, it would drop down, and if the locomotive is doing 90 or 100 miles an hour going forward, or in a piston valve engine, and suddenly the valve gear reverses, you'll have a little bit of an issue. So, this is supposed to be forward, but Keith has this as forward timing. The way to fix that would be to flip this crank to the same phase, but the other side of the wheel center. It's easily fixed. The pendulum lever, or the combination lever, or whatever the name is, the names aren't important really, as long as you understand how it works, is that this provides a bit of a time delay. 
It keeps the valve in the same position for a longer time, and instead of a sinusoidal motion of this valve rod, you sort of get a held sinusoidal motion. And it changes depending on where you put this. Walshart's valve gears are known to be able to notch down to 15-10% if you get them really right. The Stevenson's changes the phase of the timing because you introduce a different phase as you go toward the middle of the link by the other eccentric. So the lead changes. A Stevenson's is a better hill climbing gear for this reason. I didn't know that. You learn a lot from Alexander Carnes. He's very knowledgeable for his years. He's only a bit of an embryo. I mean, he's not been out of nappies very long, but what this guy knows is just ridiculous. The only reason for that is because I've been around these things basically since I could walk, and I've had some very generous individuals let me play around with them a lot and teach me a lot. And uh, not, not many people my age, even with the interest, get that sort of luck in their lives. So be between that and a lot of intensive reading and studying, and you know, it's all out there. You can find it. Um, you know, you, you pull up books from the period, power plant engineers' handbooks, locomotive, uh, locomotive fitters' handbooks, things like that. Uh, it's all there right in the old literature. And if you've, got, if you've got a decently mechanical mind, it's very easy to figure out. I'd like to thank my friend Alexander Cairns for contributing to this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.